uh, began to spread into private life at the beginning of the 20th century, the end of the 19th and the beginning of the 20th century. In 1900, only 9% of households had telephones, so that would have been the, the more wealthy and the upper middle class. By 1910, however, 41% of households had telephones. So clearly, the industry had figured out how to solve the problems of scale and scope and to develop, uh, deliver a product at a very low unit cost. By 1920, it was 61% of households had telephones. By 1930, 81% of American homes had telephones. Not quite universal, but close enough. So everybody except, we might say, the bottom fifth, very poor, ha would have a telephone. You would expect that as a normal part of life, just like having a television today or a laptop. Well, yeah. Actually, the figures are somewhat comparable. Long distance calls were expensive, and thus you didn't undertake them lightly. So you would not be expecting a phone call from your parents in Santa Barbara unless there was a problem. So you still had some distance, if that's what you wanted. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, these figures, I was just wondering, in those films with the black communities in Florida and then even the main farming, I was thinking at the time that these They probably did not have telephones. No electricity, right? Right. No electricity and no telephones. Now, the Japanese families in the first film are urban, oftentimes small towns. So they would have had uh, electricity would have been taken for granted and telephones would have been taken for granted. Uh, there's, they're actually, uh, we're going to get to that. 1920s is when the plug is pulled on rural communities. And there's a major influx into the cities for all sorts of reasons. Um, and we'll, we'll get to that. But uh, the population becomes overwhelmingly urban. But that in, uh, urban is defined as any town with more than 5,000 people. So... Uh, you know, somebody, uh, somebody moves from the farm, uh, you know, to uh, a place like Sebastopol or Ojai or Santa Paula. Uh, they were in a very small place, but they would still be considered urban. Um, so, uh, but the spread of telephones did mean that families could begin to stay in regular close contact much closer than they had regularly uh, before. Even when people moved to other areas, and if you stayed in the same area, if you were all living in Los Angeles or Santa Barbara or the Bay Area, you could probably expect to get a phone call from your mother or father every, once a week, if not every day. Uh, you, or they would expect you to call. If a different culture emerges where, or more, maybe on more practical terms, you would start calling your friends every day to find out what's going on and is anybody going to be doing anything interesting. So you can start organizing your social life in a much more different way than you had before you had telephones. That's what we could think of as Telephones are the spiritualization of communication because there's no, you are now able to act on your impulses. You are able to make real things that you would like to do, but previously thought couldn't be done. Similar figures to the telephone uh, can be found with the rapid spread of electricity as the primary source of light and energy in cities and suburbs. Electricity, as we, if you recall, developed, first developed really in the 1880s as a substitute for steam power. Uh, and it was thought something that, it was something that could provide an alternative, cheaper form of power 
for uh, factories, a form of power that would rely on American machinery instead of British built machinery, since the British firms produced very, uh, very effective and very good steam driven machines. Uh, by 1929, 80% of industrial plants were run on electricity. Uh, electric lighting was, street lighting was installed by city governments, starting first in the downtown shopping district, but then spreading out along the major boulevards, and then finally hitting residential side streets, first in the nice neighborhoods. That's a funny phrase, nice neighborhoods. Uh, then moving into uh, neighborhoods that uh, are, might, uh, might be considered more popular, uh, where uh, more, a broader sector of people live. Uh, after 1900, it became pretty mandatory for new homes to be built with electric wiring. And people, uh, people owning older homes started rewiring or wiring their homes. Electricity opened up a whole new set of markets for household goods like washing machines, vacuum cleaners, electric irons, electric toasters, electric sewing machines. All of these, uh, there had been markets for the, uh, well, not for vacuum cleaners, but for sewing machines. And there had been hand-driven washing machines. Uh, but they, uh, they were, not that practical, they were expensive, but once you could electrify, once you could take advantage of electrification, you could start mass producing these in a quantity that the unit price could come down, and you would take advantage of the fact that you don't have to uh, sweep uh, anymore. You can use a vacuum cleaner. You don't, uh, washing, you can just shovel the clothes into the washer. You'd still have to use a, a clothes dryer to, uh, clothes dryers are a little bit more uh, complicated technology uh, to develop, so you'd have to use clothes lines. Um, it all, electrification also changed how people live by making it much easier to stay up late or to go out at night. The habit of retiring at sunset and rising at sunrise remained a feature of rural life in the 1920s, where electrification was rare until the New Deal. But in the cities, electricity was so much cheaper than the previous forms of lighting that there was no reason not to stay up all night if you wanted to. Uh, you might think, well, people could stay up all night, but if a candle or a kerosene lamp costs you, you know, a quite a bit of money to run for a long period of time, and you might have to choose between having dinner or having light, you might choose the dinner and go to bed earlier. With electrification, you didn't have to make that choice anymore. Um, so uh, another uh, common consumer item was the camera. First, the, the Kodak Brownie that allowed you to take snapshots. Uh, and then movie cameras, uh, which were not necessarily uh, that common. Prior to uh, this period, you went to get a photo taken of you, meant you had to go to a studio. It was expensive. The pictures were highly formalized. They never looked like you, though they always tried to make you look super nice. Uh, and then there were traveling photographers who would take pictures of you at fairs and that. Uh, but the pictures are always posed. With the development of instant cameras that were pretty cheap, families could start documenting their own lives, their own family histories, everyday life. You, could, you started to have the candid, uh, candid camera kind of thing. And family photo albums and the sending of pictures through the mail became another way of holding together families that were stretched across uh, space. Uh, and we'll continue this uh, on next Monday by considering the question of mobility. So have a nice weekend.